I imagine all you East Germans out there tonight are wondering how an American boy who don't even spreck in the language got up here on this day. <laughs> well, it's not just because I'm a good-looking guy. It's because I got a song to sing. Come and listen to my story. I think you'll all want to know about an American drifter who had nowhere to go. I caught a plane over to Europe to make it in a big way. Turns on, turn red. Understood in his native land? There are many clues, but few answers. We traveled to Chen's hometown and talked with some of the resident locals. His mother had this to say. My lawyer says I can't talk about him at all. I'm suing the U.S. Department of Immigration for keeping him out of the country. Uh, could you tell us something about his childhood? <laughs> <laughs> There's not much to tell, just me and him and the TV in a trailer near the Nevada border. <laughs> we were able to talk to one of his childhood playmates who had this to say. Hey, we all used to live in a trailer park, and we'd play among the abandoned missile silos and nuclear waste dump. Look, he was a pretty forgettable kind of guy. Excuse me. Um, I live right next door to the Reeves family. Let me tell you, that Eugene was a real brat. Bad manners and worse teeth. Well, Kid says I can blame the youngster, though, you know. Not having a real pappy around can make it real hard on a kid. You know, Molly, his mom, she didn't even know who his real pappy was. She would sleep with anything that wasn't tied down. <laughs> Makes you wonder how the kid managed to become anything at all. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> He was considered an average student who 
However, he did leave an indelible impression on his high school principal. Well, you knew the boy cheated all the time, but no one could ever catch him at it. <laughs> and he was a real troublemaker. He was the kind of kid you thought would eventually climb a tower somewhere with a shotgun and just start shooting people. <laughs> Of course, he did something much worse than that. He became a communist. That makes me sick. <laughs> Miss Charlotte Grip. I was his homegrown teacher, so I kind of feel an itsy-bitsy-bitsy-bitsy it's responsible for how he turned out. <laughs> I tell you, the whole town was in a state of shock when they heard that Reeves boy had gone and started living in that stink. Oh, we politely called Russia. Bad enough he didn't do his patriotic duty and enlist and fight the fight in Vietnam. He didn't even have the guts to take the chickens way out and go to college. Uh, politics aside, could you tell us what he was really like? Oh. <laughs> called himself a poet. Kept saying things like, a poet's got to do what a poet's got to do. And if I'd known he was going to defect, I'd have shot him dead right there in my classroom. <laughs> I never would have thought why that kid looked just like any other kid. Next time thank I'll you. know better when those little darling steps over. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Gene had one passion, music. <laughs> He washed dishes at the local watering hole, the Spud and Crop, to pay for his piano lessons. <laughs> well, Gene was the smartest and the laziest student I ever had. I mean, he was brilliant without purpose. <laughs> uh, I mean, he said that he wanted to be the next Liberace. <laughs> I told him that there was only one Liberace and that, well, one Liberace was one too many. <laughs> I mean, all he ever talked about was fame and fortune, but the kid couldn't get through his scales. I, you know, I should have suspected that there was something wrong with him when he said that his two favorite composers were Rimsky and Korsakoff. <laughs> Thank you. In an interview, when Gene was asked why he taught himself to play guitar, he said, To get laid. <laughs> It was just yesterday. Yesterday. She pulled up beside me in her spanking brand new Chevrolet. Chevrolet. She said, Little boy, little girl is gonna make you a man. Make me a man. I looked her in the eye and said, I do not think that I understand. Turned this little boy into a big, big man. She was the girl in the Chevy on a night I remember till I died. Till I died. She wasn't too skinny or too heavy. Her love and made the strong man cry. I catch myself thinking about her every night and day. and shiny things that went fast. Things went fast. But she was different when it came to making love. She wanted that to last, to last, to last. When our magic night was over and our love it came to an end. Came to an end. She dropped me on the corner and whispered. Thinking about her, but I 
I'm sad to say This stupid boy let the girl in the Chevy drive away La 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 This stupid boy let the girl in the Chevy drive away
Jewish ways form the basis for her own strident belief in the Communist Party. She heard him singing in a coffee house. And from that point on, her life would never be the same. We were so different. <laughs> it was scary. I, I guess that's what made it so attractive for us. You know? An Orthodox Jew with a Cowboy, <laughs> a real Marxist and a true capitalist. He said we were hot. And I like it when he said things like that. <laughs> we, we met in Chile. Hmm? Allende was just coming into power, and I was there uh, because I win a, you know, get it, a, a prize. A prize from the state for the college graduation from the film school. But uh, Jean was a bigger prize. I was shocked by my feelings. <laughs> my life was devoted to the state. I even had my parents arrested for religious practices. <laughs> what would the state have to say of my love for the... groovy gringo? <laughs> I was scared dead. But my love, it laughed at my fears. It was one of those times and places where anything seemed possible. Romance was in the air. They would make love for hours, and Dasha would read to Jean from the works of Lenin and Marx. Jean loved Dasha and communism, but he balked at the idea of sharing his wealth. So Dasha demonstrated the concept by giving him the greatest blowjob of his life. He got the point. They were having a wonderful time. Allende brought to Chile a sense of boundless hope. It became a beacon to leftists from around the world, and they flocked there. 
the groovy gringo did a concert with Peter, Paul, and Mary. He gave Gene some <coughs> advice on chord and lyric changes. Mary told him to get rid of his pompadour, but Dasha was even harder on him. I am the groovy gringo. I come down from the Lord day. I am the true bingo, and music is my forte. anti-American press from this Reeves, but I got nothing. The photos and tape that were wasted on him. Oh, oh sure, he looked like he was seeking asylum, the insane kind. Mm. And he was, he was drunk all the time. When the press finally stopped laughing and started to ask him questions, he couldn't even give any good answers. When I asked him, why did you come to our country? He said, for your health plan. <laughs> I should have shot him right there. Pravda saw it for what it really was, a stupid love story. I was sent away for a rest. I needed it. It should be noted that not one U.S. paper picked up the story. But for the first time in his life, Gene was truly happy. He loved the fact that he didn't understand a word anyone was saying. <laughs> it gave him peace. <laughs> While the state uh, pondered what they should do with him, I had already put into motion my own plan. Within less than a month, Jean went from the singing in the marketplace to a sold-out concert which I had arranged at my former university, <laughs> the Latvian Gina Plots. <laughs> and was already beginning to make Jean's wildest dreams come true. Uh, <laughs> I hear the front row seat. Dasha made sure of that. My gun was loaded. I made sure of that. <laughs> 
KGB. Thank you so much. <laughs> For an encore, Jean played a new tune. Years later, Pravda declared it the quintessential condemnation of their adversary in song. I am not particularly fond of America. Thank you. I am not particularly fond of the U.S. of A. Everybody! We are not particularly Off the sweat of the breast of the crust of the rest of the oppressed. And so you can see why we are not particularly. And so you can see why we are not particularly. And so you can see why we are not. He is terrible, the worst. You know nothing of music. The state pays me to know music, and I know music, and that was not music. <laughs> is Wilkes too advanced for you? <laughs> don't make me laugh. I don't know why I asked you. I'm a member of the Communist Party. You know politics, not art. But to a true communist, my dear Dasha, <laughs> they're one the same. <laughs> politics, art, and life. But the crowd, they were for more. What do the Russians know about music? <laughs> it's not a balalaika, they get excited. What am I going to tell Jean? Tell him I'll have a contract ready for him in the morning. Oh, what about all of those things you just said? I said he couldn't make music, but why should that stop us? I see Jean as a great propaganda tool for the state. So Jean will perform in Moscow. Jean is not ready for Moscow. Um, Moscow is not ready for Jean. He will be our ambassador to the world. They love him in South America. Let's send him to Central America. And that's only the beginning. What if Jean says yet? Tell him he has no choice. He's working for us now. Or he's not working at all. Two weeks later, they were flying to Central America. In the gift to Balba and I, just enough time to begin a bootleg operation which would spread Jean's tapes throughout the Soviet. Jean loved Central America. He was traveling first class the whole way. First stop, Cuba. Castro loves Senor Jean. Senor Jean taught him a dirty Irish limerick. And Castro took him to a baseball game. It made Senor Jean a little homesick, but he did not let it get him down. He was on a mission. He was excited. There were rumors that the CIA were at every performance. The CIA had me follow him everywhere. He was amazing. I went to all his concerts. I bought all his records. Nobody cared about his politics. They just loved his music. You gotta remember that outside of a few evangelists and the Up With People tour, there's not a whole hell of a lot of entertainment in Central America. <laughs> I kept telling them at the agency there were better ways for me to use my time, but they wouldn't hear of it. They were convinced that Gene was up to no good. 
As far as I could tell, he was just up to making money. There's nothing more American than that. What upset the CIA the most was the fact that he sold more records in Nicaragua than all other record sales combined. It was a big hit, even with the Contras. And nobody was a hit with the Contras. <laughs> The government captured over 2,000 Contras at one of his concerts. I was there. What? Reeves was in the vanguard. He anticipated many musical styles, including rap. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. which in Russia we're selling like pancakes. A public outcry could be heard from every corner of the motherland. We want gin. We, we want gin. We want gin. We want gin. We want gin. Publicly, Soviet officials expressed dismay over the bootleg tapes. But privately, we were thrilled. It was taking the public's attention of the poor industrial and agricultural outputs. Not to mention the dismal fashion situation in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Morale was high in spite of the rising cost of consumer goods. The time was right. Gin was finally ready for Moscow. Never had Russia experienced such an outcry for an entertainment figure. After two weeks of sold-out concerts at Moscow's Olympic Stadium, Bull Band Gosha organized Gene's first Russian tour. Tickets were gone before they went on sale. In less than a year, Gene Reeves was a Russian national folk hero in a one-man industry. His popularity irritated many higher Soviet officials, but there wasn't much that they could do about it. The czar of rock and roll was becoming an integral part of Soviet life. <laughs> Is this the line for potatoes? <laughs> there are no potatoes. <laughs> Bits! There are no bits. <laughs> What is this line? Gene Reeves' new album. <laughs> wow! What it is called? 
I'm a Russian cowboy guy. What a great title! He sold over four million copies in Estonia alone. And now, King Telstar Records and Tapes present the greatest poker games of Mr. Eugene Reels, as accompanied by the Upper Mongolian Children's Choir. And the strain of live television production was taking its toll on Jean and Dasha's relationship. As uh, Jean gets uh, bigger and bigger, I get smaller and smaller. <laughs> he wouldn't listen to me anymore. He thought he knew it all. We argued all the time. Five. How do I look? Wonderful. You always look wonderful. But this show, it is stupid. Four. Well, that's what the public wants, my little cabbage flower. What about you, Jean? What do you want? Do Three. You of course you do. Enough to marry me? Two. What, ruin a good thing? You make me hate you. One. But I won't. And a heidi heidi housekey to all you little buckarooskies and buckarieskies. And here's that big strapping cowboyski you all tuned in to see. The Mr. Eugene Reeves show. And here he is himself. Howdy, comrades. <laughs> I knew that uh, Gene was just using me. <laughs> he probably always been using me. But uh, I couldn't help myself. I was his slave. <laughs> Gene was beginning to achieve sporadic attention in the American press. Ticker Beasley, a specialist in animal husbandry, <laughs> read about him and flew to Moscow to see him. <laughs> I was shocked when I seen that picture of Eugene and Brett. Uh, just, just something about it went right to the very marrow of my bones. It, uh, I was struck down. Well, uh, but don't, don't ask me how I knew. I just knew that boy was my son. Hmm. I mean, I'd heard that uh, Molly Reeves had had a boy not too long after she stopped seeing me. But, you know, hell, she'd been seeing that semi-pro ball team about the same time she was seeing me. I never thought he was mine. And Molly never said nothing, so I just figured he wasn't. But, but he was. There was no denying it. That boy was my spitting image. Oh, God, all them years of neglect on my part. I mean, I, I was all tore up inside. I was just a choking on my guilt. I got me a passport, and I flew over to Moscow just as quick as I could. You know, I wanted to make it up to the boy. You know, go fishing, play a little ball, or just talk and... I finally was able to get a meeting with him, but I told him who I was, but Gene had only this to say. Fuck you. <laughs> a little shit. Gene never discussed the incident, Shana. By now, Gene's television program was being seen by every country behind the Iron Curtain. I got Gene his own promotional tour. That was where he met. Ludmilla. <laughs> I will never forget the first night I met your chain. It was his first concert in East Berlin, and my theater company went on a whim. It was wonderful. 
I knew from the instant I saw him we were destined to be married. At last I thought, a man I could make cowboy movies with. <laughs> it was why I became an actress. Cowboy movies were my passion. And your chin was a real cowboy. Or at least he had the hat. And that was a start. <laughs> Before I met your chin, my life had no focus. I had no Nazi and a loyalty. I had called myself a Bowena. Now, I was a Yochina. <laughs> this man is my homeland. <laughs> this man is my country. This man transcends for me geopolitical ideology. No man is an island. But he is as close as one can be. Understand, Chin Reeves is my homeland. This man is my first place. This man's my utopia. This man has set me free. I'm floating away like a Haitian refugee. Before I embraced him, I see I had no identity, no great man. He serves as my home. I directed it. <laughs> it was part of my contract. My work was left strong over the cutting room floor. It is ladies. It made more money than any other film shown in Russia that year. Hmm? Lord Miller, who had been paid more for not being seen than for all the times that she had been, had this to say. That Dasha is a helpless bag of shit. And Dasha responded. Lord Miller is a stinking bitch of a slut. And Jean only had this to say. Great. <laughs> I was the wardrobe mistress. On which way are you going, Mr. Cowboy? <laughs> It was made on a shoestring in the Urals. But Jean was very resourceful. You see, they didn't have any horses, so they rolled elk. <laughs> <laughs> but the audiences didn't care. They loved it. Eugene's elk became as popular as Jean. He rolled him in every picture he ever made. <laughs> Even when everyone else was riding horseback. <laughs> Through an ingenious film technique, the elk was able to talk. And he always had a little speech about his old pal, Jeans. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget him, Mom. Without Jean, I'd be just another moose in the crowd. <laughs> She was in the next film. Gulag Rock. <laughs> you know, Jane, 
again, my beloved. I am not happy. What's the matter, my little wiener schnitzel? <laughs> Here's your next picture, Eugene. This is a problem. I'm not in it. Hey, I just make them. I don't write them. Well, then, Eugene, I'll be seeing you. I have a career of my own, you know. Oh, shit. I need you. Then show me. Sure, my little sasher tort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you need that. But I need more. I need a lifetime contract. <laughs> sure, no problem. Uh, Gulag Rock was a triumph. Chin and I were brilliant, and the elk was marvelous. <laughs> My lawyer met a desert in Trainee, Hinky Pinky. Gulag Rock made more money than anyone knew what to do with. <sighs> By the third film, Love Me Tundra. <laughs> Things were getting worse and oh. worse. It, it was an impossible situation. Good oh. Miller and Dasha both had contracts for life with Jim. <laughs> I tried to tell him it's not a good idea, but uh, he had a big heart, and he was, as, as you Americans say, uh, uh, a horny guy. <laughs> so to ease the tensions and to give Jim time to think things over, I got him a concert in... Grenada. The day after Jean arrived, the United States invaded Grenada. The <laughs> Senor Jean's concert was canceled, so he hold an impromptu one on the beach. The American troops were so impressed, they sing along with the Senor until dong. <laughs> Jean was overwhelmed by the sheer joy of communication. For the first time in years, he was communicating with those who understood his words. It was like he had gotten a long-distance phone call from some old forgotten friend. A Marine captain, one Oliver North, begged Gene to stay on the island for morale purposes. In return, he said that he would give Gene all the snow tires and lingerie he could handle. <laughs> captain North has asked for time to make the following statement. <laughs> Eugene Reeves was, was without doubt one of the truly great <laughs> artists of our time. Not, not only could he write wonderful songs, but, but he had the God-given talent to sing with the best of them. But without his presence, I, I doubt if my men could have survived the week on that God-forsaken little island. There wasn't even one of those those terrific Holiday Inn cocktail lounges for the men to relax in. I'll never forget his, his last night on the island. It was the last time I ever saw him. And, well, sir, the last song he sang, it was none other than the Marine Corps hymn. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I wept during it, and, and so did most of the fellows. We, we wept like babies. Well, like baby Marines. And when it was done, well, I, I hate to admit it, but, but it's true. I kissed him. <laughs> Not on the lips, but close. I've known some great men in my time, including the president. And... Not including the president. <laughs> and Eugene Reeves is the only one that I've ever kissed. I spent a lot of time with him, and, and I knew his story, and, and he wanted to stay and, and come back with us, but, well, sir, I told him to get his butt back to Russia. He had some real power there, and, and if he used it, well, who knows, I told him. I'd, I'd get things rolling on my end, and, and maybe the next time we met would, would be at the Berlin Wall, and, and we'd both be singing, if I had a hammer, and, and we'd be singing what that song is really about, a, a jackhammer. <laughs> We, we both saw it happening, uh, Eugene and I, did just as clear as day. Well, sir, I, he made it to the Berlin Wall, and of course, I never got there, but, but if I had, we, we would have changed the world. Uh, 
I really don't care what anyone says. That man was a true patriot. <laughs> The Grenada invasion put even more attention on Jin. Hundreds of thousands of Jin's fans surrounded every major airport awaiting his return. They would not be satisfied until he was brought home safely. Over one million fans were there to greet him. Jin assembled an international all-star cast to sing his newest hit. It won the first MTV award for best foreign language video produced on a small island being invaded by the United States. <laughs> and Casey Kasem refers to it as the cornerstone of MTV. <laughs> Grenada is an island paradise. Grenada is a place I call very nice. You can drink piña coladas with lots of crushed ice. You can send your kid to med school at half the price. But if your country towards socialism leans, you got to mess with the U.S. Marines. It's the balance of power that changes every hour. It's the balance of power that the third world should cower. You're over there, and we're over here. To check for change would be really great But rebellion was stopped The Kremlin was upset In Prague they said It's just the tanks we get He messed with the Red Army Corps Now he ain't gonna mess anymore It's the balance of power It changes every hour It's the balance of power The third world should cower Everyone thinks that their side is right Station troops by our satellite. I think the Tantis are drying up with a ring flower. Neglected, neglected, neglected by the balance of power. This is a very lovely country we have here. But they don't like our politics because we're too near. So they will mine our harbors or they'll napalm our land. If they leave a crater here or there, they hope we understand, man. We have to maintain the balance of power. becoming more popular than the state. And in Russia, whatever you do, don't be more popular than the state. <laughs> Jin was in big, big trouble, and there was nothing that no one could do. I tried to warn him, but he just laughed and patted me on the head. <laughs> Jin uh, seemed a difference. When he got back from Grenada, a, a changed man. Now he was always talking about wanting to do something important, uh, something that mattered, but he didn't know what it was. 
I told him it was time for us to make another movie. Not a cowboy movie, a real movie. Jessa made him money, but I made him happy. He had everything a man could ask for, except a family to call his own. And I was ready to give it to him. He jumped at the chance. A few days after his triumphant arrival, Jean and Ludmilla were married. The state performed the wedding without pomp or circumstance. Not even the press was invited. They were told to stay away. Ludmilla, it turns out, was three months pregnant. When I hear it, that Jean had married that slut of a bitch. <laughs> I tear up my contract. I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill her. I wanted to die. I am feeling so much pain right now. She made another film with Jean, this time just the two of them. And as much as Ludmilla wanted to be in the film, she couldn't do it in her condition. So she was content just living with Jean and his trailer on the set. It was um, the first, the last, the only time Jean and I ever tried to make art. It's never had more than a few showings. We call it, it the rebel and the yerk. <laughs> remember it now for its uh, lurid color lighting and the fact that the chin, instead of riding the yerk, the yerk is now his sidekick. <laughs> The state said they found it interesting, but they felt it had no place in the Russian life. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I realized that the state could be fallible. They had missed the point. <laughs> that, uh, that the Yelk is no longer the slave and Jean is no longer the master, you see? <laughs> nominated for an award by the Russian Society of Filmmakers. It was my best work. It would have been a great film, but, uh, well, Jean's heart just wasn't in it. 
Wilbur, Dasha, Jean, and Ludmilla tried to coincide the birth of the baby with the opening of the Rebel and the Elk. That didn't even save the picture. It was a baby girl. They named her Sasha. Jim's Russian fans were very upset when he chose Ludmilla, an East German. Look, we Russians could deal with the love triangle, but we were a little upset when he chose to marry a Nazi, even though his other choice was just a Jew. <laughs> At least Dasha was a Russian. Look, she could have had Ludmilla's kid if he had just married Dasha. We Russians may make demands, but in the end, hey, we don't ask for much. <laughs> and to make matters worse, it was Jean's first film without a song. Jean could do anything, anything, if he just sang. They loved to hear him sing. They loved to hear him sing. That's what Dasha smiles. I still feel she tried to destroy Jean in the Rebel and the Elk, his last film. You slut, you bitch. <laughs> She and I left Russia and moved to East Berlin. I had got a very extravagant home there and was still a very popular figure. Jean was seeking refuge from both his popularity and notoriety. The elk and I went to work on a picture together. <laughs> and Sasha and Jean was content to watch over Sasha at poolside or to take off a box near the Berlin Wall. <laughs> if Jean sang at all, it was only for Sasha. After Jean left, I tried to call him. When he would pick up the phone, I would talk. He would hang up. I was only trying to help him. I never saw or heard it from him again. July the 17th, 1986, Eugene Reeves vanished. Ludmilla was at the set at the time. Wrapping up her second film, co-starring the elk. <laughs> when I returned home, Sasha was alone at poolside, eating her cereal. <laughs> Eugene was nowhere to be found. There was no notes, nothing. Not a clue. Just our baby. And so, what did you do? I called our few friends. No one had seen or heard from him. Did you then call the police? You call the East German police only when absolutely necessary. <laughs> I did what I could. Which was what? <coughs> I stayed up the entire night waiting for his return. <laughs> I didn't. And that was the best you could do? It was all I could do. I, I couldn't leave Sasha alone. What is this? I have nothing to do with your people. I lost your chin. It was my life. I couldn't sleep for a week. To this day, still you wonder what happened. There were so many who were so jealous. Many say he ran off with Desha, but it is laughable. If anything, she is the one who killed him. She has never gotten over the fact that your chin was mine! <laughs> I wanted to have her brought to trial. But without a body, there was no case. <laughs> <laughs> the news of Jean's demise reached America by shortwave. A ham operator in Savannah was the first to hear it. Yeah, yeah, I got the news from this ham in Vladivostok, you know. He was a big fan of Jean's. Uh, he, 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 all he ever talked about was Jean, Jean, Jean. I thought he was kind of a strange guy. But anyway, he figured that Jean had been murdered done in by both the KGB and the CIA because Jean was getting so close to making world peace a reality that then they'd both be out of jobs. Said Jean was 
was uh, he was going to build a shrine to Gene and, and pray for his return. And, and then he claimed that Gene was, was so big that not even death could take him away. Oh, well, well I, I was trying to calm this guy down, you know, and something very strange happened. We was jammed. Yeah, I never made contact with him again, and I try all the time. Pretty strange. <laughs> Seems like there's more to this Reeves fella than meets the eye. I know, because I checked with a friend of mine in the CIA. Uh, who knows? Uh, it was probably the, uh, the KGB. <laughs> when Jim left the USSR, he was broke. We didn't want him. The U.S. of A didn't want him. So he went to the only place he had left to go. East Berlin. Boy, is that one ugly town. <laughs> we in the KGB couldn't have picked a better prison. We didn't have to kill him. He was already dead. The elk, who was rapidly rising in the ranks of the Communist Party, <laughs> could not hide his grief. <laughs> the wardrobe mistress for Jean's films had her own theory. Lord Mila. Lord Mila, Lord Mila. Uh -huh. I think she spooned them piece by piece into her beloved garbage disposal. <laughs> yes, yes, she was very proud of that disposal. It was the only one in East Berlin. Oh, that woman was cold, very cold. And now that Eugene was no longer making records or tapes, he was useless to her. She started getting very close to the elk. Too close, if you ask me, it wasn't natural. <laughs> I'm sure Lord Miller killed Jean, and my life has been empty without Jean. No one will ever replace him. <laughs> no one could. Jean was unique to the Soviet experience. One of a kind. All South America mourned his disappearance. You bastards. gotta do what a poet's gotta do. But I'll be with you always. A record, tape, cassette, and now CD. And you mark my words, I'll be back and I'll be bigger and better than ever. That's a promise. You know, I've seen it all now. I've seen the United States the Soviet ones, and the South American, too. I've seen the rich and the poor, the right and the left, the middle and the center. <laughs> and I've learned one thing. We all make music. And it don't matter what you're singing, just as long as you're singing it. Oh, yeah, we all have different rhythms. We all have different words but it's the music that makes us all the same yeah <laughs> you know I think if anyone was to attach a label to me the only label I'd accept would be an artist of love 
Good night, y'all. Thanks for caring. And remember, save that last dance for Jean. begins in Moscow. I had been invited to the Moscow International Film Festival to present a film. I was walking through Red Square with my interpreter when we saw a man being mobbed by hundreds of people for his autograph. Oh my God, said my interpreter, it's Dean Reed. I said, who's Dean Reed? Who's Dean Reed, exclaimed Oleg. I can't believe you've never heard of him. Why, he is the most famous American in the whole world. 
Эстрадные политические песни нам нравятся. Но нравится, если, во-первых, он красивый мужчина. Ну что, хороший парень, наш простой. Работяга. Ну, в общем, знаем, наверное, довольно-таки мало все-таки. Но песни мы очень любим. Совсем недавно на кинофестивале я смотрела фильм его «Пой, ковбой, пой». Вот там он играл главную роль. И что я могу сказать? Фильм был очень веселый. Это была его собственная постановка. Ну, мне нравится как актер. Что я еще могу сказать? фильма и режиссера фильма, который он снял в ГДР. Фильм называется «Пой, ковбой, пой». Вы этот фильм сегодня увидите. Позвольте представить слово Дину Риду. Здравствуйте. Я очень рад видеть вас. Я, у меня один большой проблем. Я не говорю по-русски. Я говорю испанский, итальянский, немецкий, чуть-чуть по-английски. А вы, а вы, я, да, я не, по-русски очень, очень трудно. I'm very, very happy to be here in Moscow again at the festival. Я очень счастлив снова быть в Москве на фестивале. This is uh, the first comedy that I've tried to make in my life. Это первая комедия, которую я пытался поставить. Первая комедия в моей жизни. Because I believe that laughing, to laugh is also very, very important. ist äh, seit vier Monaten in den Filmtheatern der DDR und hat schon etwa 700.000 Besucher. 
Das ist ein fantastisches Ergebnis für ein so kleines Land wie die DDR. Ну, в общем-то, я вам должна сказать, что думаю о Дин Риде. Но я, наоборот, знаю его больше как исполнителя. Вот, и я люблю его песни. Правда, некоторые? Мне нравятся такие его обработки американских песен, как «This land is your land» и, как же она называется, я даже не могу вспомнить, «I wish I'll overcome». train is built for speed now, this train. This train is a built for speed now, this train. This train is built for speed now, fastest train you ever did see now. This train is bound for glory, this train. But once I was playing ar around with my radio, and suddenly I tuned in a Russian version of the Voice of America. And that was a sort of a program or request. And the announcer said, the, the announcer said uh, here we've got a letter from Nikolai X from Mechachkola, and he asks us to play the last recording of an American singer whose name is Dean Reed. Dear listeners, there is no American singer whose name is Dean Reed, we don't know such a name. He does not exist. That's why, dear Nikolai X, we shall play for you the last recording of The Doors. I used to think that peace and love were just to say hey. Then I learned that life is not only a gay hey. Each man must fight and fight again. But never, 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 never let your life Flow away, let your life have value every day. Always, always, always give your life for the dream. Don't forget your man at times, life's not just as it seems. Well, I'm a, a Illinois farmer. I grew up on a hog and corn farm. Nine out of ten of us are conservatives. But I'm a conservative and he is an admitted socialist. <laughs> he uh, has offered to pay half of my fare if I wanted to come over, but I'm not interested in those countries over there. Over there. Dean's picture imprinted on this little shirt, little T-shirt. You can't see it because now it's all faded. But anyway, it's a good-looking picture of Dean, right? And underneath it says, Dean Reed's mom. And so I could see myself going in, into customs in East Berlin, you know, and flipping over my coat and saying, here I am, you know, sort of thing. Of course, it went over like, as I said, a lead balloon, right? It just, or a deflated balloon. It's simply didn't go over at all. The Germans didn't see anything funny about it. They didn't understand what I was doing. And when Dean met me, he was really furious with me. He didn't laugh either. I still think it's a cute joke. <laughs> anyway, I'll never do that again. When I left Colorado, it was many years ago. The blue skies were clear as ever. The sun, it was bouncing off the snow. After we got married, my husband was a school teacher, as you well know, Sterling was a teacher. And we moved to a farm just on the outskirts of Denver. And Dean, so Dean was born in Lakewood, Colorado, at, at this small chicken farm that we owned. And we had a very, very small house because the chickens needed large chicken houses, right? But we only needed a little tiny house. But he was a charming child, uh, sweet and with this big smile. 
and um, oh, he was in Boy Scouts and and uh, 4-H club where he had a pigeon project, and then of course he went to military school and learned how to ride, and he. Um, uh, took first prize at the stock show in jumping. He had two horses of his own that he trained. He became a track star. He ran not only the mile, but um, also other races. I can remember so well that poor little boy. He was only 12 or 13 years old, scared to death, in a great big auditorium, Phipps Auditorium, I think they named it after Senator Phipps from Colorado. He was a little guy. He was called Slim Reed in the early stages. And he got up on that stage and playing his guitar. I know he was scared to death. <laughs> well, I remember, I think we got it for his for his Christmas. Was it Christmas one year that we bought him a, a guitar? And he just simply took off. From there on, he did a lot of volunteer things, too, like singing for the Kiwanis or, or singing for the hospital up at Grand Junction for the Veterans Hospital. And he was always doing things for people as far as his voice and guitar was concerned. My life's dream to be a real cowboy. When we first began research for this film project, the earliest mention of Dean Reed we found in U.S. periodicals was a 1956 Newsweek article. At the age of 17, Dean made a 25-cent bet with Wild Willie Smith that he could outrace a mule for 110 miles. 47 hours later, Dean Reed collapsed at the finish line. I had gone to lunch and, and uh, someone had a newspaper and there, of course, was Dean's picture about him racing this mule 110 miles and winning the quarter. I still have the quarter. Did I show you the quarter? I still have that he won with this race. Of course, I was really worried about it because 110 miles is a long ways to run. And I called him up and, and thought, oh, he'd be in the hospital or something. But no, there he was singing that night with his blistered feet. <laughs> the show must go on type of thing. I think there are only two things that I've kept with me for the 20 years since I left America. One is this guitar, a Martin guitar, which I took with me when I left, which I've, it has been in the jungles with me in Brazil and Bangladesh. Uh, and this buckle are the only two things that I've kept for the 20 years since I left America that has traveled throughout the world with me day by day. They know my life better than any of my, uh, than better than my children or better than my father and mother or my wife. Uh, they were there through all of my experience. I'm just a country boy. Money, money have I none. But I've got silver and stuff. And I've got gold and morning sun. And I've got gold. And I think probably the only reason one begins to play the guitar at 12 is to, to impress girls uh, at that time. I was a very shy boy. Uh, I would think uh, maybe an insecure boy to a, a point. I did not have that good a relationship with my father where uh, I was the rebel of the three. I was the only one at, at this school who the whole time had his radio on hillbilly music. And at that time, hillbilly music was not popular. So when did you start performing? Uh, I became a, a performer at the university because uh, my older brother Dale was already studying at the university and my father didn't have enough money to pay the tuition for both of us uh, and to give us our living expenses uh, for the apartment and eating. And so the only possibility so that I could go to university was to take my guitar and every evening to go into the restaurants 
and uh, to sing uh, for the tips. At that time, nobody paid me. I sang for the tips which the people gave to me at each table. And during the summers, I sang at the Dude Ranches in Estes Park in order to pay my way through the universities. A meteorologist was studying for two years meteorology at Colorado University. And then he quit and went to Hollywood. He bought a Chevrolet Impala convertible, and he probably owned the one or two of the tires on it. And he started to Hollywood. And on the way out there, he picked up a hitchhiker. And that hitchhiker was an old has-been entertainer. And he took him over to Capitol Records. And Boyle Gilmore was the big shot there at that time. And Gilmore listened to him sing two or three songs and signed him up for seven years. You'd better keep by your side. He hung on and hung on and hung on. He got a few uh, TV bachelor father and so on. And How about everybody turning over to my house? I have that new Dean Reed album and it's a real gasser. That's for me. Let's go. Oh, it's just quiet, please. Yeah. Students, parents, before the drum major at contest starts, I am happy and thrilled to announce that one of our most distinguished alumni is with us tonight and will sing his latest hit recording, Twirly Twirly. Let's have a nice welcome back for Dean Reed. I went to a football game and I never will again. That pretty little, pretty little, pretty little, pretty little, pretty little, pretty little made you rest. Just twirling around and whirling around and she got me so upset. That pretty little, pretty little, pretty little, pretty little, pretty little made you rest. Hollywood uh, was a time of fear. Hollywood was a time of exploitation. Hollywood is a prostitution camp. Hollywood is a place where very few people, I think, are able to keep their integrity. Uh, of course, there are many people who have their integrity in Hollywood, and these are the people I respect who were able to keep this integrity. It was a time uh, that was not especially that happy. The best part of Hollywood, of course, was finding the best friend of my life, Mr. Payton Price. Uh, and he's, because of Payton, I didn't lose my integrity uh, in Hollywood. Because of him, uh, I was not only remained uh, with my integrity, I became a better human being during this time in Hollywood because of Payton, though. And he was astonished by this new world that he'd been catapulted into and perhaps the quality of the people that he had found. He found it not to be the usual Hollywood, hard, hustling, commercial type of people, but youngsters who were really interested and dedicated to film. Because I was teaching the film aesthetics and film principles and film techniques. The basic thing I think that impressed Dean, <clears throat> which he has kept, the instrument that you use in performing is what you stand up in. And the quality of that instrument is, and the quality of your life is the quality of your performing, but your quality as an artist. And I think that business of being truthful to one's own self, not pretending to be as they do so much in the theater, but actual being, where one is, where one stands in the moment and listens and talks his own person. No affectations, no sense of performing at all. One just is. Hayden taught us all in the school, first of all, that you could not do anything of worth as an artist unless you were a human being with worth. Uh, he taught us that each one of us had to search for our truth 
and when we found it, to defend it no matter what the consequences. And he always said, your truth will not be ours, it will not be mine. But your truth is important and you must defend it, no matter what the consequences. I worked with him on this film. I really heckled him on this film, Sing Cowboy Sing. Here, he would get up and make a speech and say, I owe everything to Peyton Price. He's here, my beloved friend, everything. And I'd get by, right behind him in the camera, and I'd give him a piece of advice, oh, and he'd totally shit. reject it. I don't think he took one piece of advice I gave him through the whole film. Now, since the film has been very successful, you, you might, then you will perhaps understand the quality of my American advice. I first met Dean when um, we joined Warner Brothers and we went to their, um, in 1960. So I've known Dean almost 25 years, headed towards 25 years. And um, he was in the acting class that was run by a man named uh, Peyton Price, who uh, is um, kind of a mentor, a uh, real close friend of both of us. And uh, we spent a lot of time during um, uh, the 1960-61, right in that period. Dean was exceptionally good at acting. He was real good in the class. I was really bad, but D Dean was quite good at it. And um, I didn't know Dean sang so well until um, he, um, you know, I heard his records, you know, at the time. He's a good singer, good actor. So as a performer, he's well-rounded and um, quite capable. He's also a gymnast, you know. I'm sure that everybody knows that. But um, the last time I um, performed with him uh, in East Berlin, Dean could still walk on his hands. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Cuckoo, I'll swing right through the air. You'll come back to the ground. So many things will dear as they know when we're around no more. Shall you be a kind no more? Uh -huh. Swing right through the door. Lift you off the floor. And you won't be crying no more. Come He's his own manager. He always has been. He's, he has had charge of his own destiny, and I've been absolutely amazed. Dean has done very, very well. He's worked at it, he's known where to put the emphasis. Standing out in the cold in East Germany, with me freezing to death by his side, autographing hundreds of pictures, and I'd say, hey, I'll see you inside. You know, he wanted to do it because he knew that that picture meant something to those children that no one else could give them. So here was a famous person who could go anywhere in the world, who could live in any country in the world. And he chose them. He chose socialism. Over in um, the Iron Curtain countries, his popularity is really unbelievable. I mean, um, uh, when I would, I'd stay at Dean's house a couple of times on, like, on the weekends if we weren't working, and if I wasn't in the hotel, I'd just go out and stay with them. And um, in the mornings, there'd be 15, 20 girls with flowers waiting for Dean to come out, and uh, uh, he gets mobbed after the show. And um, I've never been with him in a place that everybody in the, in the entire place didn't know him. Over there, it's just phenomenal. People do not know what this is like here, what the people are like who live in this country. Uh, and it, it, the greatest thing would be if we could bring all 240 million Americans and bring them here and let them know the Soviet people, let them know the society. It's a society that also has its mistakes. The people are very, very responsive, very knowledgeable about what they listen to in, in East Berlin, where I played. I also played in a, uh, we did a television show out of Karl Marx uh, style. And um, it was really nice. The audiences are wonderful. As we all know, worldwide, people get on. And music is the most common language. And, and uh, if uh, the whole world were musicians, there wouldn't be any war.
if Dean were working in, in the United States with uh, success, with the same kind of success, that his compensation would be a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times more than what he earns in um, uh, East Germany. But um, I don't know if money would have been enough of a motivation for Dean to have uh, done that, you know. I think he's just really very thoroughly in, involved in, in what he believes in. and. Um, as we all are, but it's just, uh, his doesn't pay as well as it does in the capitalist system. Zwei italienische Immigranten waren zum Tod verurteilt bei der amerikanischen Justiz. Ihre einzige Verbrechen, sie haben einen Traum gehabt. Sie haben geträumt von einer Welt ohne Aggression, ohne Krieg, ohne Ausbeute. Für diesen Traum, die beiden waren von der amerikanischen Regierung umgebracht. International Solidarität konnte diese zwei Menschen nicht retten. Aber in der Zwischenzeit, wir haben tausende Leute durch Solidarität gerettet. Ich möchte in diesem Moment ein Lied für diese zwei einfache italienische Arbeiter singen. Ein Lied für Nicola und Bart.
sorry his popularity wasn't in this country, but he tried. Dean's uh, records on the Capitol labeled a couple that did pretty well. The one that hit in South America did pretty well. And they were playing it and playing it and playing it. Well, don't you know that build up popularity? Although the sun is young, I'll try to keep me on. Although you won't be with me. South America, of course, was a great, uh, a great surprise. We arrived, we went on an airplane, got on an airplane, and flew down to Santiago. At that time in the United States, I was relatively unknown. The, the, the song, The Search, was a regional hit in some parts of Texas and Arizona and Colorado, but nothing more. That was the first record. The third record, Our Summer Romance, I had done on, t on TV with Dick Clark, and I had made a tour of America, but it was not a national hit, although it was on the top 20 list and number one in certain parts of America again. All of a sudden, I got on a plane, and it, when I got off the plane in Santiago, there were hundreds of thousands of people waiting for me at the airport with the motorcades with police going into the city, going to bed at night with the whole plaza in front of the presidential palace uh, screaming for me. Of course, this is a great shock uh, to a young boy from Colorado. to make it here. He had a choice. He can't be two places at once. He can't be making a career in South America and Italy and, and the Soviet Union and uh, Czechoslovakia and, uh, and East Germany and be here at the same time. I've heard this all over Europe. Why didn't he ever make it here? Well, you know how, how much time he spent in America since he left to go to South America? I mean, in the United States? I, oh, less than a year, maybe not even six months, and that was visiting us. You see, I have absolutely no doubt that if he'd stayed here to make a commercial career, he would be as famous here as he is now in the socialist bloc. He went to South America. He was a normal American boy, and he'd been to college two years, and he went to South America. There he saw where 10, 15 percent of the people were very wealthy, and the great majority of them were at the low end of the totem pole, and there he began to get these uh, not communistic but socialistic, and there's a difference. Don't ask me what it is, but he can take 10 or 15 minutes, and he'll tell you the difference. He did that to me once, but I forgot most of it. But South America was the most important, and South America changed my life, because, of course, there, uh, one can see the great differences of justice and injustice, of poverty and wealth. They are so, gr so clear to see for anybody that you must take a stand. And I, sometimes I like to say, well, that uh, there are three types of people in South America. There are blind people who don't want to see the truth. There are capitalists, and there are revolutionaries. And I was neither a capitalist nor was I blind, and there I became a revolutionary. Because in South America, you have to take a stand. You are either for the status quo, which means that tw for the 20% who have all of the wealth, all of the power, or you will stand on the side of the 80% who are illiterate, who are hungry, and who somehow want a better future. And I felt that this fame that I by destiny, happened to have in South America, had to be dedicated towards these 80 percent. In one way or another, we're fighting for their liberation, and we're fighting for a better life, a life with dignity. We are sang in two, for two different types of people. They had the m most luxurious nightclubs in South America for the wealthy class, where I would sing uh, at 11 o'clock for the dinner show and at 3 o'clock for the, the drunk show. 
then they would sell me to the football stadium, where then the masses could come and see me. There was too many contradictions all of a sudden. Uh, I didn't realize that there was such poverty in the world, and uh, I started changing. I started working with the unions uh, in South America, working for free for them. I would go to the not only the hospitals, but the prisons and sing for free, and slowly I was becoming involved. It was while he was living in South America. He would do some of the damnedest stunts. He was in Caracas, Venezuela one time, and he intentionally did something wrong, and they put him in jail. He wanted to be in jail so he could see the conditions <laughs> in the jails of Venezuela. He, they let him out the next day when they found out who he was. cost me uh, to go to jail in, in Santiago, Chile. One week before the elections, in 1970 in Chile, before Salvador Allende became president, well, I got this flag and I went in front of the American consulate in Santiago and washed it and uh, said that I, as a good American, want to wash this flag. The flag is dirty with the blood of the Vietnamese people, with the blood of the South Americans who are being exploited because of American imperialism. And that I, as a good American, I want to wash it in, with the great, within the great traditions of the American Revolution. And uh, the police came and arrested me and took me to jail. Uh, you know, it, some people have said that you washing this flag in Santiago was one of the reasons that Allende was elected, because he won by such a small margin of the popular vote. So obviously Allende won because he had the right politics and he was going to help his people. As you, uh, he did win only by a less of one, than one percent. At that time, uh, of course, it was in every paper that I had been arrested because they, everybody said it was very clear that the old government of Frey was only in president because he was, he was supported by the American government. If an American, the Chilean said, if Dean, who's an American, cannot stand in front of his consulate and wash his flag, without the Chilean police coming and putting him in a Chilean jail, then obviously we're a colony of America. Oh boy, was he a big hero in Mexico City. This just shows his venturesome courage. There was a big fire going on down there, and there was an old man in there screaming, screaming, screaming. He was going to be burned. Dean got a blanket, soaked it in water, went in and carried the old man out. And I'm telling you, did he get publicity in Mexico City? <laughs> Let me finish my story. And then from that to where he was singing in Helsinki, Finland, to an international peace conference, he met some interesting people there. Maybe he told you this. 
some representatives from Mongolia were there, and they invited him to come to Mongolia. Well, I got a letter from him in Moscow, and the uh, next letter I had was from Mongolia. I've got a picture in there of him and an old Mongolian monk. In 1965, I was living in Argentina, and the Argentinian Peace Committee invited me to be part of the Argentinian delegation at this World Peace Council meeting. And I went representing Argentina at that time. And uh, Valentina was there at that time, also representing the Soviet Union, and I decided to make a, an interview with her. Estamos con la Senata Rusa, la primera mujer que hizo vuelo en el aire. Es primero, más que nada, una mujer de todo. Está casada, tiene hija. Es bonita, como se puede dar cuenta. Y vamos a hacer algunas preguntas a ella. And I took this interview back to Argentina and put it on my show, of course, without informing any of the authorities. It was a very an, uh, interview talking about her personal life, talking about life in common. Usted escucha la nueva ola alguna? Ah, vam dreta sevremenna muzika, kad nova vlna, kako je nazivaju. Ja ljubljuju хорошую pjesnu. And uh, the next day, after showing it, the uh, political police arrived at my home and asked me to come to their bureau in Buenos Aires, where it stayed there, it was above the door, a sign saying pro-Soviet, and they wanted to know how much the Soviets had paid me to make this film, of course they hadn't paid me anything, I'm sorry to say, but uh, and they wanted to know, of course, why was I doing communist propaganda, that I wasn't doing communist propaganda, that I believe that artists and sport and science are international. Those are the especially things that, that uh, go across borderlines, and especially scientists and artists and sportsmen must believe in peace and work together. And they are the, and the vanguard of the fight for peace. Now, the politicians, somehow, they always stay behind us, but somehow we have to get ahead. <laughs> And uh, after that time, they began attacking my home and uh, painting the, the hammer and the sickle on my, my house. And that was in 65, and this campaign developed and developed. So they had to make a law saying I put into danger the security of the nation. I was expelled from Argentina. The, something else that was very important, uh, the last evening in Helsinki, we had seven artists were invited to give a concert and during this congress it was the last congress where the chinese took part and at this meeting there was great problems and they asked me to sing to get the people quiet and i began singing and the soviets were so impressed with how i uh, got the people all to hold hands and started singing we shall overcome that i sang for about a half hour and the soviets invited me to come to moscow and the next day i was on a trip to moscow Entertainers in Russia used to come out on the stage, stand there so straight up and down and so dignified and whatnot. Dean came out on the stage with a uh, uh, eye-striking costume on, and he jumped off of the stage, and he'd be singing while he did this. He'd jump off of the stage, and he'd go down and put his arm around some little girl and sing her a love song. At first, she was scared to death. Afterwards, she got, she liked it. And he'd do the same thing with some gray-haired woman. He'd put his arms around her, and uh, he just did it so differently than what they were accustomed to. Dean Reed was one of the first singers to bring rock and roll to the Eastern Bloc. Until his performances throughout the Soviet Union in the mid-60s, American rock and roll and the country western music of America was seldom heard in concert. Russian 
American girls just adore him. And um, the, his style of behavior, the way he talks to the audience, the way he finds the contact with the audience is really uh, interesting and it involves people in the action that's happening on the stage. And he's dedicated to uh, the struggle against, uh, against many evils of our times and against political oppression as well. After I got expelled from Argentina, I went to Spain and of course was not allowed to work in Spain under the Franco dictatorship. And then I went to Italy. I was uh, I was asked to make a film, a Western film. Valentine, hi. Valentine, здравствуй. It's been so long. Как давно я тебя не видела? Your favorite model, aren't I? We uh, never quite met. Of course, at that time, the spaghetti westerns were very, very popular throughout the world, and. Uh, I made these type of films in Italy. I started in eight films in Italy during the three years that I was there and uh, worked for the peace movement in Italy at that time. Uh, at that time, of course, the war in Vietnam was going on. The American aggression in Vietnam was taking place. And I had sung at many demonstrations against the war in Vietnam in Italy. But one Sunday in Italy, for example, when you have a demonstration, Will, you have to ask permission from the police and since uh, the progressive forces were very strong in Italy, most of the time the police granted approval. But one Sunday, there was a demonstration in front of the American Embassy in Rome, which they had asked permission and it was not granted. And I had not known anything about it. And I had gone into town to Via Veneto to have a, a glass of orange juice or something. And I passed the embassy, it's right next door, and there was a great amount of police, three lines of police cordoning off the U.S. Embassy. And there were the demonstrators. And so I stopped my car. And so I, this was, for some reason, this day I had my passport with me and I had a tie-in. I don't know why I never have a tie-in, nor do I ever have my passport. I even got married without a tie. And I went up to the first line of police and I said, hey, I'm with the American em embassy, let me pass. They said, si, signore, si, signore. And I went to the second line and said, hey, I'm with the American ambassador, let me pass. Si, signore, to the third line, right on by until I got to the front door of the American Embassy, and there was the American ambassador, and there was the head of the police, the political police, and you know him in Italy because they have an old law that he has the three colori, the, the three colors of the Italian flag. When he has that on, it means he can arrest for political reasons. He had that on, they were talking. I came up, they didn't even notice me, by their side, I turned toward the crowd, I went put my fist, and I said, compagni, means comrades, Viva Ho Chi Minh! The two went, and almost broke their necks doing it and said, Who is he? Who is he? Dean who? <laughs> almost again. He said, Who is he? Arrest him! Arrest him! There he rides into fire. politics are, you know, the exact opposite of mine. I supported Reagan when Reagan ran for president, and, um, you know, that's not something Dean would do, but uh, it's something I believe in, and we, it's interesting, too, one of the main things about um, Dean and I is that uh, we, differ, we differ totally on our politics, but uh, we're able to be friends, and uh, we've been good friends, and uh, we have a lot of fun together, too. In fact, most of our time isn't spent talking about politics unless we're joking, and, uh, we just spend our time laughing and things like that. I had tried to return to Argentina four times from Italy. This time a group of revolutionaries got me into Argentina and uh, there I gave a press conference. They all of course asked me, how did you get here? How did you get here? And I said, on the winds of justice that are starting to fly over Argentina. About two hours later, I was arrested, taken to the main prison of Argentina in Buenos Aires. Uh, a very nice story about arriving in prison. Of course, when you go to prison, well, of course, you in all throughout the world, you have to take your fingerprints, and uh, then you have to get your hair cut. And we arrived in the night to prison. They said, "Okay, Dean, we got to cut your hair." Another prisoner will do it. So we went through the through the jail, through the great, it's a large prison. And in Argentina, homosexuality is against the law, and homosexuals are in prison. 
And as they took me through, on the right side was a great big cell with about 40 homosexuals in it. And I have never seen such makeup in my life. They had made it with, from salad, red and blue and green. And they all recognized me. In Argentina, I had been very famous. And they all said, Dean Reed, Dean, give him to us, give him to us. And I had never been so afraid in my life. And the, the colonel said, you go in there if you're not good, Dean. <laughs> now, yeah, they cut my hair. About 10 days after being in jail, one day the police came in and said, Dean, you got anything to wash? You know, and it was in wintertime. And I don't like to wash very much, only flags. <laughs> Nothing else. Well, and uh, I said, yeah. And they said, many of the homosexuals like to do it, and if you can pay something. So I completely stripped nude, and I had my winter coat over me. The next day I said, hey, it was getting cold. I said, hey, where's my clothes? And the police came and said, ah, we're sorry, Dean. We'll get them for you. About 10 minutes later, they came back with a smile on his face and said, Dean, we got a small problem to tell you. And I said, what's wrong? Where's my clothes? And he said, Dean, the homosexuals tore all of your clothes into little pieces as souvenirs and <laughs> And so I didn't get any more clothes until my attorney brought them to me the next week. He could see me once a week. But anyway, I stayed that time uh, for 21 days in prison. And so on the 21st day, I was taken to the airport and sent back to Italy. Wohin wandert ihr? To my name, After returning to Italy, Dean starred in the only East German, West German co-production in history, Aus dem Leben eines Tagenichts. In English, The Life of a Good for Nothing. While it may seem strange to the Germans that an American was chosen to play the lead role in this classic German story, what some Americans may find strange is Dean's second role in the Eastern Bloc, Kitten Co., the film rendering of Jack London's novel about the gold rush and gambling days in Alaska. Alaska braucht Männer. Here, the saloon entertainer sings Alaska Needs Men in German on a set in Bulgaria with a socialist film cast. <laughs> It was here that he met the woman who he now considers the great love of his life, Renata Bluma. Only through destiny do I live in the GDR. If I had not grown in love, I would not have lived in the GDR. Here, all of a sudden, by chance, I'm in love with somebody who lives in a socialist country. Here is an opportunity to see what socialism is like in practice, not only in the hotels, where I'd always only stayed in hotels, but that wasn't socialism, I knew. And I thought, here's an opportunity, I can learn German, and I can see what is socialism like in practice. Ich hätte nicht gedacht, dass Sie so weit kommen würden. You gonna drink coffee today? Ich will to Kaffee drinken heute? Oh, no. No? Aha. Hmm? Yes. Renata Bluma is one of the most famous actresses in the socialist cinema. For her starring role as Jenny Marx in the eight-hour film special, The Early Years of Karl Marx, she was awarded the Order of Lenin for Art and Literature. Ich will nicht, dass du so vernünftig wirst. Wir haben sehr gut zusammengearbeitet. Er war ein guter Partner. Aber ich war sehr misstrauisch. Ich wusste nicht, was dieser Amerikaner bei uns will. Und ich habe befürchtet, dass er die Politik benutzt, um Karriere zu machen. Es hat viele Jahre gebraucht, bis ich erkannt habe, wer er ist und wie ehrlich er ist. Er lässt alles liegen, seine Schuhe, seine Bücher, sein Papier, alles bleibt liegen. Äh, er liebt nur Cowboy Boots, only Cowboy Boots. Das ist terrible. I am starting to write my own scripts. I've written now three scripts. Uh, the last three films I wrote myself. 
and now I'm going into directing. But uh, I believe also that I want to reach masses of people. Uh, and uh, film work, for example, or songs, obviously you can reach more masses than books. Uh, the majority of the people in the world are still illiterate. They don't know how to read. But uh, they do go to the film houses. The first screenplay written by Dean Reed was titled Blood Brothers. It is based on the massacre of the Sand Creek Indian tribe in Colorado. It was filmed in Bulgaria and became the Eastern Bloc's most commercially successful film of 1975. Des Häuptlings wechselt ihr einige kurze Gelübde und jetzt... Ja, was jetzt? Jetzt seid ihr Mann und Frau. Mein Mann, immer mein Mann. <lacht> er ist mein Freund, mein Geliebter, mein Kompaniero. Wir sagen, Kompaniero schließt alles ein. Ich möchte mit ihm leben, mit ihm arbeiten, ihn lieben. Er ist der Mann, den ich mein ganzes Leben lang gesucht habe und an den ich nicht mehr geglaubt habe. who was a singer in Chile who was murdered by the fascists in 1973. I made a feature film about him, and I had been invited to America by some of the universities to show this film. And I went to Minnesota to show the film at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And when I was in Minneapolis, a group of progressive people came to me and said, we're going to have a meeting on Sunday against the second largest coal company of America who are building these great power lines across the land of farmers only to make profit for themselves and the farmers are against these power lines and so i was there uh, clyde bellacourt was there the leader of aim i sang and gave a speech and 20 of us were arrested 19 of us stayed in jail uh, 10 of us went on a hunger strike until our liberty or our death and uh, we stayed on hunger strike for 11 days on the 12th day we were given our trial after three days of trial, we were declared not guilty, of course. The point is, of course, I say, because the, it was only, of course, because there was an international movement of solidarity for us, 
from the socialist countries especially and from South America, thousands of telegrams arrived at President Carter at that time saying, please release Dean Reed. How can you arrest a man for singing a song? There's a lot of people in the United States with, with, uh, that would have um, uh, a political attitude maybe that would be similar to, to Dean that we all are aware of in the United States. But uh, Dean lives his politics. And um, I have a lot of respect for a man that lives his principles. And uh, it's all well and good to have an idea and, and live here and under this system. But Dean actually lives it and, and really works for it. Will, I think, was the first time that I truly fell out of grace uh, with the American government uh, because at that time I was in Santiago, Chile, and I had read a book by Linus Pauling against the armaments race, against atomic testing, telling of the dangers of atomic testing. Uh, so I took out personal ads in all the newspapers with my own money asking the people of South America to send letters to President Kennedy and to President Brezhnev asking for the stopping of all atomic testing. At that time, uh, the American government, through its embassies in Peru and Santiago, Chile, tried to stop all of my uh, activities in television, in radio, and that was the first of the snowball that then started rolling. I asked to see my CA file but I don't believe they gave me all of it. I think there's a conspiracy of silence about my life and about what I've done. Not only do they want to make me look like a traitor to the American people, but they'd rather just kind of hush it up. It's because the whole policy of the journalism in the United States, the media, is to blacken the eye of the socialist countries. And there is nothing truthful that I've seen in the American press about the socialist countries, and you may, they may have some facts about that are truthful, if a fact can be true, but they are not truthful, nor do, they, nor do they intend to be. I believe that I have more information than the average American because of the fact that I have both. I read Time and I read Newsweek, and I watch the news program every evening from the GDR and from West Germany, both of them. And then I make my own judgment as to what, who has the most truth. There is nothing, almost nothing is black and white in this world. Ausgangssperren zu verhängen, Verhaftungen ohne richterliche Weisung zu befehlen, sowie Ausweisungen und Verbannungen anzuordnen. By far, at least 17 people were killed, as many as 1,200 arrested yesterday. And the question now, Mary Speck reports, is how many such days of protest can the military regime survive? It was the worst violence in Santiago since the bloody coup that overthrew President Salvador Allende in 1973. More than 30 people have died so far in clashes with police and soldiers in the past four months. As this newscast was being broadcast in America of August of 1983, Dean Reed returned to Chile. It was the first time he had been in Chile since the military coup that overthrew the democratic government of Salvador Allende. Dean was warned by the Chilean police that he was not to do a concert to benefit anyone. Here, in the copper mining town of Rancagua, people brought food donations for the miners who had lost their jobs because they had tried to strike. That night, Dean sang a song that had been banned in Chile since the military dictatorship of Pinochet took control ten years earlier. He sang it for an old friend of his.
this concert, the home where Dean was staying was surrounded by 60 armed Chilean police. He was expelled on the next plane out of Chile. I call myself a revolutionary artist, and I have a feeling that if I call myself that, I have to also be willing and ready to, to, do this, to risk my own life in the same way that those other people whom I'm inspiring with my songs or with my films or with my poetry are risking their lives and their, uh, their liberty. And uh, I'd like to try to remain a, an honest uh, revolutionary by showing I'm ready to do the same. Ghost riders in the sky. policy of the United States government is, uh, is a policy of genocide against the Palestinian people. So I think it was important that I went there to the south of Lebanon and to say that I'm ready also uh, to risk my life to defend the south of Lebanon. Uh, at that time there was a fear of invasion from the Zionists. Later the Zionists invaded. 
This is very difficult for my wife, Renata. She can only, ha in her fantasy, know what is happening to me in Lebanon or when I go to Chile or to Nicaragua or someplace else. And of course, she has a great amount of fear of these trips. Uh, and I am afraid that she cries a lot when I leave. Ich fühle Angst. Aber ich verstehe ihn und ich lasse ihn gehen. Ich kann ihn nicht festhalten. Wenn ich ihn festhalten würde, er würde unglücklich. Und er muss dorthin fahren. Aber es ist nicht leicht. Hast du etwas, was du sagen willst zu dem amerikanischen Volk? Ich kenne das amerikanische Volk nicht. Ich könnte nur etwas zu allen Völkern sagen oder zu allen Menschen. Dass ich auch hoffe, dass wir uns alle verstehen, dass wir die Schwierigkeiten, die unsere verschiedenen Gesellschaftsordnungen mit sich bringen, überwinden. Und dass wir alle eine gemeinsame Sprache finden. Sie sagt geil, Kanto. Fuere la rosa. Y de que sirve la rosa sin el canto. This is a very poor country, Nicaragua. The only crime they ever made was that five years ago they overthrew a very corrupt dictatorship of the family of Samosa, who had ruled the country as their own private enterprise with the help of the United States government, of course, for many, many years. The people wanted only to have a revolution so they could eat and have something in their bellies. The CIA is sabotaging the first schools these young children ever had. They're sabotaging and mining hospitals with new peoples for the first time they've ever had. I thought that if I came here as an American and could sing and to, could talk to them, maybe in some way it would help inspire them to continue the fight against the forces of the CIA and the monopolies which are trying to, to sabotage this revolution. <laughs> to any people. I don't think that the American culture is an enemy to the people in socialism. I don't believe that the Chilean culture is an enemy to the Nicaraguan people. I don't believe that the Soviet culture is an enemy to the American people. I think that all people should have the right to see the culture of other foreign nationalities and countries and also defend their own culture at the same time. This is a song of Martin Luther King. Это песня, которую пел Мартин Лютер Кинг. It began with the civil rights movement. 
Ее начали петь участники движения за гражданские права. И сейчас эта песня распространилась по всему миру. Я пел эту песню в тюрьме в Аргентине. Я пел эту песню крестьянам в Бангладеш. Я пел ее борцам палестинцам на юге Ливана. Давайте ее споем сегодня здесь, в Москве, все вместе. Мы преодолеем. outside the United States. Uh, but I remain an American citizen, and I would prefer to remain an American citizen. I am an American. I'm a, I'm a product of this society. And I'm very proud of my people. I'm very proud of our great traditions. I think of the American Revolution. First of all, that means that I'm ready to risk my life, though, to give my life in one way or another, to make life a little bit better for some other human being in this world. Um, it means that I do not believe that you can truly, within the system of capitalism, make it into a just system for all. I don't believe that, through reforms. I believe that uh, there has to be in the system a radical change, a revolutionary change, meaning it takes one leap from a qualitative to, from quantitative to a qualitative step, and that means it will change to a socialist system. That doesn't mean it will be by arms, taking up arms. It doesn't mean that people will have to die. Obviously, I'm a revolution because I want to save people's lives, not because I want to take them. Um, some people have to fight for the liberation, as in El Salvador. Because of a military dictatorship, they have no other means to defend their rights and defend the right that they have to eat, to live in peace, to, to work. They, they must do it through force of arms. But obviously in the United States it would come about in a completely different way. Everybody's talking about a bagism, shagism, dragism, madism, ragism, tagism, thisism, thatism, isn't it the most hairy, hairy Krishna? All we are saying is give peace a chance. We say America is the freest country of the world. And I would answer yes, probably so. You have the freedom in America to be unemployed and to have fear of not having enough to eat. Nobody has this fear. There is no unemployment in socialism. You, uh, you can have an, this special freedom in the United States, as my father, for example, who worked his whole life, and yet when he writes in a letter that he has, he's had a toothache for a year, but he hasn't gone to the dentist because it costs so much money. That's unbelievable. I tell that to, to my friends in the socialist uh, countries. They say, come on, you must be exaggerating me because all medical facilities are free of charge. There are a lot of different types of freedom. So I would say that I feel that I am in a free society, in socialism. His voice failed him once over there, and he was in the same hospital that Kosygin goes to. He wrote back in glowing terms why Dad, it didn't cost me anything. In other words, he was trying to emphasize the advantages of socialism. He and I stay off of political philosophy when we get together because we are both reeds and we have some definite ideas. 
I looked back down many times and wished he'd have continued with meteorology at Colorado University. He'd have had a nice, quiet uh, life, maybe. I now, I now understand why there is no unemployment in the German Democratic Republic. Jetzt verstehe ich, warum in der Deutschen Demokratischen Republik niemand beschäftigungslos ist. It is the largest orchestra I have ever seen. Yep. There was a time in the GDR where I sang some songs at a political concert which the government did not agree with, which certain functionaries of the government did not agree with. Uh, I was not allowed to sing for a week in the, in the GDR until I had time to make an appointment with some friends of mine who were in the Politburo. And then uh, everything was uh, organized and said, Dean, and it's all right. Uh, we won't uh, do anything against the bureaucratic class who is afraid of making a mistake, and we won't do anything against you. But at most of these mistakes, if there is a censorship, uh, it's usually from little tiny people in the bureaucracy and the bureaucratic class of socialism who want to keep holding on to their chairs and not make a mistake, so they'd rather not do anything. If you go to the people in the Central Committee, these people are usually very, very liberal, and one can do and say what one wants. Not everybody can go to the Central Committee, and that's exactly why I go. Because I believe that in the same way that I am fighting to change society, or in Chile, or etc., where I'm fighting an enemy, as long as I'm living in socialism, I believe I also have to be honest, and to try to make socialism a better socialism. What about returning to the U.S.? Would you like to return there to live there someday? But I think, well, that's a difficult question. Nobody knows one's future. Uh, I can if I asked you, are you going to get married one or twice, two times more in your life? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, as you know, I'm a Marxist, I'm a socialist. It's not the, that easy to work in the United States when you have the views which I have and the values which I have. Uh, here in the GDR, of course, I work with people who agree with me, who have the same ideals which I have. Uh, I have no fear here of being shot at. I have no fear that somebody's going to throw a bomb at my house. Uh, I have no fear that when I leave my wife and my child here at home that somebody's going to come and kidnap them, uh, which these fears I would have in America. Um, I feel a security from my old age, of course, for my children. Uh, one doesn't know. Perhaps I would go back if the right conditions were there. Uh, I will not give up my integrity nor my dignity. I want to be creative and productive, uh, but that one can be creative and productive in any country if one has the right uh, circumstances. Dean has oft Heimweh. Er träumt davon, irgendwann wieder nach Hause zu fahren. Er liebt das Lachen der Amerikaner. Er hat nie so gelacht wie zum Beispiel mit Phil Eberly. Ich habe sie beide zusammen gesehen. Wir waren zwei äh, kleine Jungs, zwei Little Children. And, und sie lachten und lachten. Und er liebt seine Sprache, seine Kultur und er liebt sein Volk. What do you think are Dean's main strengths? A sort of stick-to-itiveness. He never gives up. Uh, a lot of courage. Uh, a lot of belief in, in people. I've never seen him distrust a person or to let a person down. Even when I think he should distrust the person, you know, there's no way he's going to do that his loyalty, his belief in, in the world, that we will manage a peaceful world. People say, Dean, are you a protest singer? Uh, are you a pop singer? Are you a country singer? Are you a rock singer? And I say, I'm a love singer. But there are many different types of love. There's love for little children, whether they're mine or the children throughout the world. There's romantic love for my wife. There's love for a walk in the park. There's love for justice, for truth. Uh, and I think that an artist should talk about all of these aspects of love, and that I try to do in my songs. Many people criticize me for that, because then I can't fit into any category. I say life is many-sided, and human beings have many different types of needs. I don't think 
he's changed a bit. He still has no money in his pocket. He doesn't have any more money in his pocket now than he had when he was here that first day I met him. And I've, I don't know how he lives, but I think he'll get more royalty off his songs. I think that uh, they were written in blood, and uh, I think he should be better uh, compensated. <laughs> What makes Dean Reed tick if it's not money, if it's not... Why is he ambitious that way? Love makes Dean Reed tick. <clears throat> that sounds corny, but it's absolutely true. And it isn't personal love I'm talking about. It is his involvement, his concern for his fellow man. Uh, what is your religion? Do you believe in God? I believe uh, in progress. I believe in peace. I believe in goodness, the ultimate goodness of mankind. Uh, I believe in cooperation between nations. Uh, I believe uh, in the, that ultimate truth will win out. Uh, and I think all of those things are also, I have noticed that also Christians believe in, Muslims believe in, Buddhists believe in, Hindus believe in. Uh, we all agree, and the main goal in life is to make life a better place for man. So somehow that he has his dignity, to somehow that he becomes, he can somehow will be encouraged to develop all of his capabilities that he has to become an integral human being. And uh, those are my goals, and those goals I have in common with all religions. But that's begging the question, do you believe in God? I don't believe in, in an official God, no. I am an atheist in that. But, uh, of course, Americans have great fear of this word atheist. Is, um, I don't think it's important if one believes in a God, and how can you define it? Every, every Christian defines it in a different way. I believe in the principles that Jesus was talking about. Jesus was the greatest revolutionary, one of the greatest of all time. He was a worker, man. He was a working man. He was a man who told us each of us should fight and give our help to other human beings, should give of our love and give of our resources to other human beings. That is what a Marxist believes in. There's nothing that, that divides Marxists and Christians. There's much more that unites us and divides us. <laughs> I'd 
tell them I'd be back someday if they just stay around. But nobody knows me back in my hotel. Oh, nobody knows me back in my hotel. One of these days I want to go back home and walk those streets again. I'm gonna sing some songs and write some wrongs that I did to my old friend. And I'll tell the old folks where I've been so I'll never hear again. And nobody knows me back in my old town. Oh, nobody knows me back in my old town. Yeah, that's gonna change. Nobody knows me back in my old town. I'm going back home.